And, and Joe's ministry has been expanded, and he's traveled the world and, and ministered on, on the platform with a lot of people you would know their names. Um, God has expanded his ministry. He, he walks in, in and he ministers in a very unpresuming way. But just let me tell you, he's flowing in the Holy Ghost. He ministers in the Holy Ghost, teaches in the Holy Ghost. Uh, miracles, signs, and wonders take place by the Spirit in his ministry. So we're, we're just going to encourage you, if you've never sat under his ministry, just open up this morning and, and uh, be, have an expectancy of the things of the Spirit of God. I know, I know that what the Holy Ghost has for you this morning, you will receive if you'll just keep, keep your spirit wide open. Amen? Hallelujah. So, without further ado, my, my good friend, minister, man of God, Clark Kent look alike. <laughs> Joe Morris, how thank you? you. Thank you. Bless you, brother. Sure, good to be with you. you Let's see if I got this thing on. Is this thing? Is this yeah, here? Oh, been good, yeah. man. Good to see you this morning. What a treat to be back with you. I th feel like I haven't been here in a while. It's been like five or six years, yeah. and uh, uh, gosh, I've been coming to be with you for almost twenty some odd years. Twenty four, twenty five. Yeah. Twenty five years. Wow, man. It's glad you came this morning. We're going to be blessed, be strengthened. Too bad our wives are gone. Uh, normally, Colleen's with me everywhere we go. And she wasn't able to come with me to Tulsa, but she'll go with me to Virginia next week. Isn't it crazy? I go to Virginia last week, fly back home, then turn around and go back to Virginia. But that's kind of the way it goes. You, it seems like we go to the East Coast every single week. But uh, uh, it's amazing the hunger that you see in all the churches. And you see an, an awareness of how close we are to the coming of the Lord. It's pretty cool. You can see that, that heightened awareness that He's coming so soon. Hallelujah. <coughs> Sure glad you came, though. Uh, I, I'm glad you did your clocks just right, so you made it. And, uh, and you're in church. Hallelujah. Man, great things ahead for the believer. You know, there is no bad news for the believer. For the world, there's a lot of sad, bad news. But for us, there's only great things ahead. Okay. Wonderful things ahead. Hallelujah. Exciting. Isn't it good to know that we're redeemed from the curse of the law? Yeah. yeah. It's good. It's it's cool that I can come into your church and I know where, where Pastor Ed's been going that right now you know that you're complete in him. You know that you're the fullness of him. You know that he's already presented you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. That he's not mad at you. It's amazing. You go to some churches and people think God's mad at them. They think God's trying to hurt them. You know, like God's going to teach me something or do that. No. It's wonderful to see how God has raised you up in the last days to be a voice and a witness right before he comes. You know, I talk about this when I preach on end times. And uh, Brother Hagin, the Lord appeared to his mother. You know, told him, uh, you know, hey, like this. Jesus appears to his mom said, you'll have a son. He looked like he was going to die. They put him in a shoebox when he was born. He was born deformed and all that. So they thought he was dead. Put him in a shoebox and they uh, realized a little bit of life in him. And uh, the Lord told his mother to name him John. How wild is that? Jesus, God, goes, uh, name your son John. Nah, I don't want to. I'll name him Kenneth. <laughs> How weird is that? <laughs> so she names him Kenneth. But guess what Hagen means in the, in the Hebrew? One, to go before to prepare people for the coming of the Lord. John Hagen, born 19. 1917, the same year that Allenby flew into Jerusalem to deliver Israel the city. Hallelujah. Pretty wild. So with that calm, laid-back mentality, God's moving all over the earth. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, just, you know, Brother Hagin, no fanfare, but the message all over the planet that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And He's coming back again. Just this last year, we were overseas preaching in some of the schools, and it's exploded. I've been going overseas for 20-some-odd years, and finally now, there's an explosion of what's going on. It's, it's just bizarre. If you'd asked me how it'd been, because you could plow and plow and plow. You could preach in France and people would sit there clipping their nails. Like, whatever. And now they're sitting on the edge of their seat listening to every single word you say. It's like something has happened. Uh, heaven's just moving all over the world right now. you got Jesus appearing to people in Iran. It's amazing. Appearing to kids in Iran. And the parents won't tell the grandparents because the grandparents want to kill them. But you got Jesus physically appearing to little kids. A little boy will go in his room it walks out and goes, uh, Jesus just appeared to me and I accept him as my Lord. And the little girl comes out, the sister, Jesus appeared to me too and I accept him as my Lord and Savior. I have a buddy of mine that's preaching over there in Ron. I preached on his TV show and uh, I like to play golf with him because he's like this tall. Makes me feel normal. <laughs> But anyway, he's, a, he, he's an Iranian, and uh, he said they can't get the pastors out there uh, to get to the people as so many people are getting saved. So, I mean, I preach a lot about Iran, how bad things they're doing now, but, man, God's moving all over the earth. Hallelujah. They got Brother Hagin's books translated in Farsi. It's pretty wild. That's wild. Pretty wild. I mean, you just see the message 
the message that Jesus is alive and He's coming again all over the earth. So we're blessed. We're supernaturally blessed. You happen to be alive right before He returns. So with that, I think we'll get right into the Word. Grab your Bibles there and you just turn where you think you all turn. We'll see if you're flowing. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I do appreciate you coming. Go to first, Second Peter or First Peter. You just pick out whichever one you feel good about. We'll see if you're flowing too. Hallelujah. Go to uh, Second Peter, I believe it is. I kind of had a little turn there. I think I'm going to preach on something uh, on the coming of the Lord. So uh, go to Second Peter chapter 3. And let's start here with verse 1. And uh, let's pray. We'll get right into the Word. Lord, thank you. Thank you for Faith and Victory Church. Thank you for Ed and Janie. Thank you for sending them here, Lord, to, to bless this region. We're so grateful for what you're doing in these last days. Father, there's so many that I, I see here that I've seen over the years. Thank you for blessing their lives. Great strength for them. Great boldness for them. Lord, we thank you for uh, an alertness to do the will of God before Jesus comes. Help them and strengthen them. Finish their course. I thank you, Lord, that we look unto you, the author and the finisher of our faith. Father, we thank you for an overflow mentality all the way up to the coming of the Lord. Great grace upon every person in this room. And Father, I ask you that we would all walk in the fullness of what you provided for us. In Jesus' wonderful name, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You know, I was preaching up in Iowa, and uh, a buddy of mine that I, I go to the same church uh, in, gosh, I can't remember the name, Oakland, Iowa, and uh, he, he's been there for about 25 years or so. This is a cool thing about his inheritance. He said, I had an uncle die and give me 30 acres of land. And uh, he said, I haven't even seen a copy of the will, but last week I ran a couple of people off my land, land hunting on it. Twice I had to go run them off. I thought, isn't that amazing? He takes care of his property and hadn't even seen a copy of the will. Just had an attorney tell him. But you have a copy of the will right here of what Jesus left you. It's amazing. Be bold about what he left you. This guy didn't, hadn't even seen his property, and he's acting on what that attorney told him. Wow, we have such a massive inheritance in Christ Jesus. I know that you know that, but I want to get into something this morning. Hey, it's 1120. When you leave the building today, you're going to know exactly how close you are to Jesus coming back. You're going to know right where you are in time. You know, so preaching on this, you know, uh, uh, people go, well, uh, of that day and that hour, no man knows. You know, that was when Jesus was talking to Jewish boys about the second coming. Because to the church, he said, you are not in darkness, that that day would overtake you as a thief. So we're going to look at some things today to show us exactly where we are. Now, why is that a huge deal? Because when you know how close you are, you, you change your life. You hustle. Amen. In other words, if the exit is really soon, you prepare for the exit and you don't let anything get in your way. You don't murmur. You don't complain. You don't get frustrated. Just like you're playing football, you got a score, the two-minute warning. You don't get in the huddle and go, I think I'm so tired. I don't feel like playing the last couple minutes. No, you've played all that time to score in the last couple minutes. So we're going to look at some things today to show us how close we are. And what it does is it propels you. My daughter, Lauren, she just got married this last year, if you can believe that. Because she was here when she was just a little pup. Uh, she used to run cross country in, in high school and uh, I would go to, to the races with her and I'd go to one corner you know and she'd run right there to the first marker or whatever how far daddy how far daddy I go Lauren you got two more miles and so she'd pace herself and you know I'd cut across the deal I needed a motorcycle but anyway I'd cut across the deal so I could be at the next marker so she'd go how far daddy how far daddy she wanted to know how much she had to push I said you got another mile so I would cut across the deal to the last marker and as I got to the last marker she would see the finish line up there she wouldn't ask me anything. Yeah. She could see the finish line and she would get that push like, hey, I haven't ran and practiced all this time to see the finish line slow down. Make sure as we get uh, the closer to the coming of the Lord, we get more fervent. We get more steadfast. We, we run our race more than ever before. You know, a lot of people go, I just wish my people were excited. I wish I was excited. You get to thinking Jesus is coming tomorrow. You get pretty excited. Yeah. Amen. Because what it does is it, it lowers, uh, it humbles us. You know, somebody go, oh, Jesus is coming tomorrow. You don't, go, you don't go to bed going, yeah, whatever, Lord. No, you go, Lord, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> My daughter got me this pen and says, Jesus is coming. Look busy like you could fake it. <laughs> you don't want to fake it, amen. <laughs> you want to be doing the will of God. Hallelujah. So grab your Bibles. I'm sure glad you came from Virginia. How cool. Uh, which church, Roanoke or, or Rocky Mount? 
Rocky Mount, awesome, awesome. Here, turn your Bibles, if you would, to 2 Peter, if you would. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. So this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you'd be mindful of the words that were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us the apostles, the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust, saying, where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Well, he gives you a little bit of an idea of the climate. He said there'd be people walking after their flesh, and they'd say, where is the promise of His coming? The sad thing is you can feel that in the church. Oh, I've been hearing that the Lord's coming back all my life. You know why you've been hearing that? Because He's coming back. That's right. And one thing about this, in the next verse, it tells you why they're thinking this way. It says in verse 5, for this they willingly are ignorant. What? They forgot about the flood. In other words, change came whether they were ready for it or not. Amazing how even today you feel people going, well, I don't want the Lord to come back because I feel like i got so much in my heart to do. Well, it's because you're not done after the Lord comes back. We're going to get into some of that tonight. It's going to be cool. We'll have a good time. It's amazing. We think, well, it's over when I'm raptured. No, it's just the beginning. Thank you for your enthusiasm. God bless you, buddy. I'll come preach to you. So what happens is, once you're raptured, you don't go to heaven and go float around on clouds. You get a glorified body. If you like to play the guitar, you'll play the guitar even better. All right. Amen. If you like to sing, you'll sing even better. It doesn't get diminished. It gets enhanced. It doesn't get diminished. It gets enhanced. And right now, you're preparing for what you'll be doing during the millennium. You're writing your resume right now. Ooh, hallelujah. I want to make sure i got some stuff on my resume. Hallelujah. Yeah, right. you're, you're writing your own chapter of the book of Acts right now. Mm -hmm. What will be written about the chapter right here in Greensboro? Hallelujah. Amen. Well, let's go a little further. He gives us a clue here in verse 8. He says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. So you know, the timing thing with everybody kind of freaked everybody out in the early church. I mean, Peter thought Jesus was going to set up his kingdom to the point that he cut that guy's ear off. They didn't know about the church age being 2,000 years. So you've got 2,000 years from Adam to Abraham. 2,000 years from Abraham to the first coming of the Lord. 2,000 years from the first coming to the second coming. 6,000 years, six days. 6,000 years of human history. So after, what happens after six days? You have the seventh day. We have it like today, it's our Sunday. It's what we would call the, the old time, old days we call the Sabbath. Jesus is our Sabbath every day, isn't he? I don't know about you, you're on the Lord's weekend. This is the Lord's Saturday night. <laughs> Amen. I don't know where you grew up, but where I grew up, we tried to get it in all in on Saturday night. <laughs> Amen. I mean, you, Saturday night, you, it, I said it the other day, weekends weren't made for Michelob, they are made for Jesus. Amen. That one was real good. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Drive safely. <laughs> Start the car, I'll be right there. Here we go. Well, uh, we're at, at the end of 6,000 years, so we're about to have that 1,000 years of rest for the earth. The Prince of Peace. You notice when the Prince of Peace comes back, there'll be peace on the earth. You know, every movie you see where, where the hero comes in at the end, they get that from the Bible. Because Jesus is going to come back and save the earth. Hallelujah. The world's not coming to an end. Jesus is coming back. Hallelujah. It's amazing that Hollywood would embrace that, but the church won't. The church doesn't want to talk. Every movie you see is all about the end of the world because they know something's coming. There's a change coming. The church ought to be the biggest voice and witness that Jesus of Nazareth is coming back to the planet. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. Praise God. I was uh, a consultant for this movie called Traveler's Gift. I don't know if you've read the book with Traveler's Gift. Uh, I was preaching down in Florida, and I'd been on Sid Roth's show a couple times. They said, hey, would you come consult about angels? I said, sure. So I get there. I, don't know, I didn't know it was Mel Gibson's guy that put up $120 million. And he goes, well, Gabriel would say this and this. And I go, well, no, he wouldn't. And I didn't know it was the, the guy that's the boss or whatever. <laughs> and I said, no, he wouldn't say that. And he goes, how do you know? I said, I've read the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Duh. But amazing, they're trying to make a, they're making a really cool movie. Uh, Tony Gilroy wrote the script. He was the one that wrote Born Ultimatum. It's an excellent movie, and it has, has uh, Gabriel in it. It's a good, good movie, good story, Christian movie, and it's cool. They're spending a lot of money to do it. But even in the midst of that, the guy sat there and he goes, you know what, I feel like i got to do a movie about end times because I feel something in my heart that Jesus is coming back so soon. So in the midst of them trying to do their deal, even this, this producer feels it in here even more than most people in the church. Wow. wow. Why? 
Why? Because Jesus is coming back. So let's read a little further here. Run, run over, with, if you would, with me to verse 17. Then I want to get to the signs here for just a minute. Look at verse 17. He said, You therefore, beloved. I like that he always calls us his beloved. Several times in this whole chapter, he calls you his beloved. Amen. It's so amazing that God's not mad at anybody right now. He loves you. So look what he says here. He says in verse 17, You therefore, beloved, seeing that you know these things before. He said, Beware, lest you also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. Now what would the error of the wicked be? That things are just going to keep right on going. They're not going to keep right on going. Change is coming. Jesus is coming back. He said, If you don't watch it, you could be led away. In other words, you could be casual about doing the will of God. And that's kind of the climate today, just like right before the coming of the Lord, just like the days of Noah. People go, in, our, in the church I live uh, in, in, in California, I don't, I'm not a pastor, so cut me some slack. I probably should say some things to shock you because I'm a traveling guy. <laughs> pastor exudes decency, traveling guy exudes urgency. Because I only got one shot at you, so I've got to kind of wake you up. But in my home church out there, I'm usually way too nice, you know, because I don't want to do anything weird in my own church. But I said, you know what? I said, if you just come to church once a week, you're spiritually retarded. Your growth is retarded. Uh -huh. If you fed a baby once a week, he wouldn't develop, would he? Uh-oh. Yet, but yet Christians will eat one meal a week and think they're strong in the Lord. Oh, wow, I'll be right back. I'll preach back here. Not going over too well in here. Let me see if I can find somebody. Anybody back here want to hear me preach? All right, I'll go outside. Anybody out here behind the building want to hear me preach? Hey, you out there, you ought to be in church. It's the last days. The Bible says to forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as some would do, especially as you see the day approaching. So the closer you get to the coming of the Lord, you get more intent to do the will of God. He said, you don't, if you don't watch it, you'll let that spirit of the world get on you, and it's a casualness, like, yeah, whatever. No, we love you, Lord. You died for me. You redeemed me from the curse of the law. You raised all of you up. He's invested in your lives so that you could be a walking representation of the, of the liberty of Jesus of Nazareth. Hallelujah. We'll have miracles. Man, I've had more miracles preached on end times than you preached on miracles. <laughs> Pretty crazy, amen? He just loves people knowing that he's coming so soon. Yeah. So l l look at this for just a minute. The one th reason you want to get into end time stuff is, is the, it's the number one witnessing tool you can, you can get into. It proves that God's God. He said, I'll, I'll tell you the end from the beginning. Yeah. Now, you, you can witness to somebody that may be real intellectual or whatever, but hang with me. Out of the 14 different prophecies of Jesus when he came the first time, you know, born in a manger, born in Bethlehem, came riding in on a donkey, pierced in his side, wore a crown of thorns, they gambled over his robe. The odds of that are like 10 billion times, 13 trillion times, so many. In other words, even if you were a statistician and didn't believe the Bible, it's, it's radical, the, the flawlessness of the Bible. Ezekiel prophesied the very year that Israel would be made a nation. Gabriel told Daniel the very year Jesus would come came exactly when he said. God said, I'm God. I'll show you the end from the beginning. Here, go back with me just a second. Just run with me just a little bit. Cut me a little slack. Go to uh, Isaiah. You pick out the chapter. How many are so glad you came today? Yeah. How many are glad you're here you're not in jail? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> it's a lot better to be in church than jail. <laughs> Some people like jail. I don't know. Never been to jail. I'd rather be in church. Go to Isaiah 46 for a second. Go to Isaiah 46 and look at this verse for just a second. Then we're going to get into the, some signs here in a second that will bless you. Isaiah 46, look at verse 8. Or look at verse 9. It said, Remember the former things of old. This is page 819 if you've got a Bible like mine. <laughs> Remember the former things of old. I'm God, there's none else. I'm God, there's none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from the ancient times... Things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand. He said, Look, I'm God. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen before it happens. No other religion can do that. Yeah. They can't. It's the best witnessing tool you have. God said, Look, this is how I'm going to show you I'm God. I can tell you what's going to happen before it happens. Wow. One third of this book is prophecy. Now you think about it. Paul talked about the baptism 17 times. Talked about the coming of the Lord 52 times. Why is that? He came and died, gave his life, and was raised from the dead. And oh, he's coming back again. It's the theme of the book. He's coming back. Hallelujah. And we happen to be a part of that, that taproot that is to be a voice right before he comes. All the more we should be heralding it that he's coming back. Just like John the Baptist paved the way for the first coming of the Lord, you're paving the way for the second coming of the Lord. Amen. All right, let's go over here and look at this just a second. Go back over to Luke, if you would. Turn to Luke chapter 21, and we'll, we'll get into some signs this morning that will bless you. 
I don't know, I, li I like to be blessed. Listen to this. I want to read you the first ten names of people in the Bible. This will show you how cool God is for a second. I know that you know this, and this is nothing new, but I'm going to get to some stuff here in a moment, so just run with me a little bit. Here in uh, uh, Adam means man. These are some first ten names of guys in the Bible. Adam means man. Seth means appointed. Enos means mortal. Canaan means sorrow. Mahaliel means the blessed God. Jared means shall come down. Enoch means teaching. Methuselah means his death brings. And Lamech means despairing. And Noah means rest. Listen to the first ten names of the guys in the Bible. Man is appointed mortal with sorrow. The blessed God shall come down teaching. His death brings the despairing rest. He gives you the plan of redemption with the first ten names of guys in the Bible. It's like there's a God involved. <laughs> yeah, he, he's God. And he, he watches over his word to perform it. We look at the precision of the word and you think about what else he said about you. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in this world. Whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. Hallelujah. A lot of people will kind of talk about the storms they go through. No, you speak to the storm. Some people try to r romanticize the storm. It's just been this and this and this. No, no, no. The storm's designed to kill you. Well, that's for somebody. Come on now. Amen. Amen. It's what you do with it what makes you strong. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. All right, go if you would to Luke. And let's get into some signs for a minute. Now, hang with me just a little bit. When we go into the Gospels, all of the Gospels talk about the second coming of the Lord. They don't talk about the rapture because the rapture is a mystery. He's talking to Jewish boys. So you get your rapture doctrine from the epistles. So now, now hang with me because a lot of people on TV will preach second coming stuff and they'll preach it all from the Gospels. And then they start preaching rapture stuff from the Gospels and you feel like you don't qualify. Because see, see, in the Gospels, he's talking to boys that aren't saved yet. In the epistles, as he is, so are we in this world. Do I qualify for the rapture? I'm him in the earth. Would Jesus qualify? Yes. You're him. You're his body. I like my buddies. My buddies call me the hangnail of the body of Christ. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but I'm still in the body. Amen. <laughs> Doesn't matter, doesn't matter how, what part I am, I'm in the body. So let's look here at Luke chapter 21. And let's look at some signs. Now what are signs for? We're going to look at some signs of the second coming so you can tell right where you are. Why is that a huge deal? God always had a timepiece in the Bible. Methuselah, we read his name a while ago. His death brings, really I mean his death brings judgment. How would you like to have a name like that? When I die, you die. I mean, how weird would that be? When you meet somebody, hey, what's your name? Well, by the way, when I'm toast, you're toast too. I mean, I would have been checking up on Methuselah, you know, uh, how, how's your refrigerator? You doing good? Buddy? Yeah. How's your food? <laughs> you, got, you got animals? You got water? What's going on? Because when he dies, everybody dies. Longest living man ever. So God held off that judgment as long as he could to, to save a righteous line in the earth. In the very year that Methuselah died, what happened? We know the flood came. So he's a walking timepiece. You could see Methuselah's life, and when he died, what happened? Flood came. So let's look at some signs here in the New Testament to show us how close we are. Because once we get into them, it, once we get into them, you go, wow, that's how close we are. And just like on the freeway, if you're going to get a quarter pounder of cheese, large fries, and a Diet Coke, you go, okay, the McDonald's is five miles. You start planning, okay, in five miles I'm going to exit. In the church, we should be sharp enough when we see these signs, we can tell how soon our exit is. You're going to leave the building today knowing exactly how close you are to him coming back. And it's amazing that people will fight for the right to remain ignorant about the coming of the Lord. Two things he said in the Bible not to be ignorant about. Gifts of the Spirit and the coming of the Lord. Yeah. Wow. Why is that? Right before the coming of the Lord, He's filled you with so much Word and so much of His Spirit that out of your belly would flow rivers of living water. So that God would have a mouthpiece, just like Daniel said, you'd be strong, you'd know your God, and you would do exploits. God's so cool that He's invested all that in your lives so that you could be literally the witness that you're supposed to be right before He comes back. It's pretty wild that, that, that he thinks so highly of you. <laughs> he loves you. He loves you. He wants to bless you. All right, go to Luke 21. All right, grab your Bibles there. You ought to mark in your Bible. Remember, dirty Bible, clean Christian. Clean Bible, dirty Christian. Amen? Come on. Hang with me. All right, Luke 21. We're going to go through some cool stuff here. Luke 21, look at verse 24. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive. This is Luke chapter 21, verse 24. They shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive unto all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down to the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now that's a pretty bold statement. He said basically when you see Jerusalem won back by the Jews, time's up. 
That's pretty radical. Now, when did that happen? 1967. At the what? The Six-Day War. We're at the end of six days of human history. So, at the Six-Day War, Jerusalem was won back. Jesus said, when you see the Jews get Jerusalem back, time's up. That's a pretty huge statement right there. I mean, the Six-Day War, we'll get into it here in a second. I'm not going to preach on it, but, man, you can see videos of the guys I preached about for 25 years. Remember the guy that had the Egyptian tanks were coming down on him? 80 some odd tanks, and there's one Israeli. This is in the Six-Day War in 67. The, the, the Egyptian guy gets out of his tank. The Egyptians have been firing on one Israeli all night. And the Egyptian guy gets out of his tank, has a white flag, and goes, I'm here to surrender to the highest-ranking officer. And the Israeli guy goes, what do you mean highest-ranking officer? It's just me. He goes, no, 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 the whole night, you've been, we can't handle it anymore. You've been shelling us all night. He said, the whole countryside's filled with tanks with men dressed in white around right the front of the tanks. The guy goes, ain't nobody here but me. The, the second day they're, they're interrogating that guy from Egypt, he said, I know, I saw the whole countryside filled. We, we couldn't stand how much you were shelling us. And the, guy, and the Israeli guy, he goes, I'm secular. I don't even believe in this stuff, but it is pretty cool. <laughs> I'm like, how much more of a sign do you need? I mean, I can tell you story after story after story after story of miracles in the Six-Day War. Why? Because Jerusalem was won back. What are they saying right now in Israel? All, all of Hamas, all of Hezbollah, they said these words to Netanyahu in Israel. 1967. If you'll go back to those borders, then we can talk. Why? They want Jerusalem. Why? Jesus is going to dwell there forever. Hallelujah. He's going to reign from that spot for a thousand years. And Satan can't stand that. You can go up on the Temple Mount, which I have, and there's flies everywhere. Go right off the Temple Mount, no flies. Beelzebub, Lord of the Flies. He wants that spot, but it's not reserved for him. There is a place reserved for him. Woo, hallelujah. It's a pit, amen. <laughs> amen, amen. So let's go here a little further. That was such a radical statement, he said. Go down a few verses. Go to verse 29. He said in verse 29, he spoke to them a parable. Now, what's a parable for? To help you understand what he had just said because it is so radical. So watch what he says. Verse 29, he spoke to them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they now shoot forth, and the fig tree is Israel. He said, look at Israel. In verse 30, when they now shoot forth, you see and know of your own selves that summer or harvest is night hand. Likewise, or in the same manner, when you see these things come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is night hand. Now look how simple and clear this is. When you see these things come to pass, what things? He's talking about Jerusalem being won back and Israel made a nation. The fig tree budded in 1948. He said, when you see these things come to pass, you can know something. Now hang with me. You ready for this? He said, in the same manner that you know there's a season change coming. How many of you, you know, the, the trees are dormant right now. It starts to get a little bit warmer. Also, the trees begin to bud. You go, wow, spring's coming. I've, ne I've never heard somebody go, no, it's not. <laughs> you go, well, it's getting warm. No, it's not getting warmer. I, I can tell it's not. No, hello, when the trees start budding in the same manner, as exact as the season is changing like that, when you see Israel made a nation of Jerusalem one back, you can mark it down in your book. You can know something. Not wonder something. Not sense something. Not like in, just like in the spring, I sense that summer's coming. Wow, good for you, Einstein. Yeah, it's because it is coming. Jesus said this is how exact that is when you see those two things happen. But I'm going to give you about ten real fast. Jesus said, you see those two. Jesus said, you see those two, you can know this. I'm going to give you about ten. He said, you can see these two, you can know that you're in that generation. Look at the next verse. You get, you buckle up. You ready? Verse 32, Verily I say unto you, this generation. What generation? The generation that sees those two events. Israel made a nation and Jerusalem went back. Wow. He said, the generation that sees these things will not pass away till all is fulfilled. So, whether we're comfortable with it or not, that's us. I've heard other people go, well, I don't believe that. It don't matter. He <laughs> goes, well, I don't believe that, Brother Joe. Well, God bless you. Good for you. Jesus said, if you see those two things happen, you're in the generation He's coming back. How wild is it that we're going to get glorified bodies? Amen? I can't wait. I, I'm the right weight. I'm just not the right height. <laughs> Amen. I've been growing this way, not this way. Hallelujah. That glorified body is going to, I'll be able to eat pizza. Woo, glory to God. Amen. A little bit of everything. All right. Look what he says here. In verse 30, when they now shoot forth. So the fig tree began to bud, 1948. Let's go through the signs for just a minute here to show us how close we are. Number one, Israel made a nation. 
idiot proof. God brought them back from all over the world. You know what I'm saying? You know, you can have a miracle. I had miracles last week in the church in Virginia. There was a little girl. I had several words of knowledge each night. There was a little girl. I said, there's somebody here. Your eye realms over like that, and the Lord's healing you right now. And uh, after the service, she come walking up to me. I interviewed her on my iPad. She goes, she goes I walked over there, and, and she, when it would happen like that, she'd, go, she'd start seeing double, come perfectly whole. But see, you don't know about that because you, you don't live there. <laughs> God does a, such a miracle with bringing Israel back to their land, the whole world gets to see a nation that was scattered and brought back. Amen. It's a miracle. God said, in the latter years, I'll revive them. Now, Colleen and I were going to date, you know, and she's from Los Angeles, and I live in Tulsa. I moved her from Los I learned how to text supernaturally fast, you know, dating by text. Well, I moved her to Tulsa because it's a whole lot better to date her in, in my town. God moved Israel back to their land so he can court her for seven years. Okay? Because he wants them to accept Jesus as their Messiah. Yeah. Wow. Amen. So he's got them close. All right. Now hang with me. Israel made a nation, 48. Jerusalem won back in 67. Those are the big deal. Huge. Those are the, the signs. It, every end time guy, that's all they, they, they it's, it's irrefutable. Let's go through a few more. Next, the Hebrew language restored. Zephaniah said, when you see that, the, the, right before the coming of the Lord, I'll restore unto them a pure language. Happened in the last hundred years. You can go there now, and everybody speaks Hebrew. Hundred years ago, hardly anyone spoke Hebrew. Never, ever in history has a language been lost and been restored. In your lifetime, it happened. Pretty crazy. I was in Israel. I was getting ready to meet with Ariel Sharon. This was like 10 years ago. I was so freaked out that I'm getting ready to meet with the Prime Minister of Israel. There were several other preachers there. You know, we had this meeting set up, and there's leather chairs there and black and white pictures. I saw the same office on TV just the other day, and I'm thinking, man, this is cool. I meet with Ariel Sharon, Prime Minister of Israel. I'm looking around thinking I need a, a, a souvenir, you know. And I was going to get a pencil because I want some Hebrew on it, you know. I grabbed the pencil and it was made in Iowa. I said, that's not cool. It was American. You know? So, but, but I'm sitting there getting more and more nervous, you know, because I'm getting ready to meet with this, this, this dignitary. And uh, all of a sudden you hear them walking down the hall and they're all speaking perfect Hebrew. All because one man said, I'm going to, Eliezer ben Yehuda, he said, I'm going to teach everybody how to speak Hebrew. Because God said, right before the Messiah comes back, I'll restore to them a pure language. So you got Israel made a nation. Jerusalem won back. Hebrew language restored. The next one would be the Ethiopian Jews. He said, right before, the, when Isaiah said, right before Jesus comes, I'm going to bring them out of Ethiopia. In one day, 18,000 Ethiopian Jews are airlifted on C-130s. There was an American man, he was known for being a, a crook and a money launderer and running from the law. He said, you know what, I'm going to pay for it. He paid 30 million bucks. And our government pardoned him of all his crimes after doing that one good deed for the Jews. Wow. Amazing. And Chuck Roberts, this is the deal. I was watching headline news. This happened in 1992. He said, an exodus that eclipses the book of Exodus. Now, it's pretty wild that a guy on TV would preach more than the church. And that, that, now, the book of Exodus, Exodus is a pretty big deal. Remember, the waters were congealed. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of, you know, I've heard people go, well, well the, you know, the, well, they say, well, the water is only ankle deep, you know, because that's, what, no, it's even more of a miracle that a horse is drowned in ankle deep water, right? No, the walls of the, of the sea were congealed. And you got a guy right now in our time saying, Exodus that eclipses the book of Exodus. There were ladies having babies on those planes. They didn't even know what nationality to tell them they were. They're halfway between Ethiopia and Egypt and Israel. What, what nationality are you? We're airborne. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because God said, right before the Messiah comes, I'll bring them back. Wow. So the Ethiopian Jews came back in one day. That's what's such a miracle, just like that. The next one would be the revival of the Roman Empire. Mm. Pretty amazing. They said, well, they'll never all come together as one state. Man, last year I went from uh, Germany over into uh, Italy, then went into France. I had really wanted to stamp on my passport, the Cote d'Azur in Nice. You know, it's so cool. So they don't even stamp your passport anymore. It's just like going from Oklahoma to Texas or Louisiana because it's the United States of Europe. The Bible says right before the coming of the Lord, there'd be a federation of nations that would come together that would be the platform for the Antichrist. The, the ones that killed Jesus, he'll come out of, revive Rome. I've been to Brussels, Belgium. You can look on the buildings there, and they have all, the, it's amazing, they have all the different decorations of, of, uh, of Babylon. There's all this Nebuchadnezzar stuff. They don't even know what it means. I'm like, holy cow, man, this is all, this is all biblical. There's a building they have there called, where there's a computer called the Beast. I mean, that's the, that's the seat of the EU or the United States of Europe, the capital. Yeah. They don't even know they're doing it and they're setting the world up for the Antichrist. It's amazing the planet right now is getting set up for a leader to come on the scene that will have a perfect thing for the Palestinians and the Jews and it'll be a, everybody's money will come to one system because everybody's all the countries of the world are bankrupt. 
except for China, and that's why China is going to come down on Israel at the end of the tribulation, because they're going to want their money back. Everybody else, everybody else got forgiven of their debt, except China. It's just amazing how everything is set up for it right now. Crazy. You have the fertility of the land of Israel. Now I've ran through all these real quick. Now it's quarter of 12. Hang with me. Israel made a nation. Jerusalem won back. Hebrew language restored. Ethiopian Jews brought back. Revival of the Roman Empire. The next one would be the fertility of the land. A hundred years ago, Mark Twain was there. He said the land is so desolate, it's so barren, it will not support life. Well, now they produce 90% of the fruit for all of Europe's producing that piece of land. The size of New Jersey. It's so fruitful and productive. People come from all over the world to go, how do you get so much per acre? And I got a magazine the other day. It's called Fast Company. It's a, it's a business magazine. David Lauren was on the cover. He's Ralph Lauren's son, and it was showing how he's taken polo into the digital age. But I didn't know there was an article in there about Israel. It said, Israel's energy bonanza. They found oil in Israel that far exceeds all of the oil in Saudi Arabia. In Israel. And they quote an evangelist while we were at Bible school. Jim Spillman came to Ramah. They quote a, an American evangelist named Jim Spillman, how he preached it all through the 80s that they'd find great sources of oil in the nation of Israel. Wow, the fertility of the land. 100 years ago, barren. Now, the Bible says in the last days, I'll make it blossom like a rose. You can go look at the cornfields, and there's, the cornfields are decorated with roses everywhere. I thought, why do they even decorate their cornfields? Because the insects will go to the roses before they'll go to the corn, so they don't have to use pesticides. Now, see, these are miracles that you don't even have to have faith to, to comprehend that God's doing this. He said it, it's come to pass. You can visibly, uh, visibly, tangibly see the, the blessing and the manifestation of God's Word. I've stood on the Golan Heights right there, and I saw the grass. You can tell where the border was. I said, how do they sprinkler this up here? Because it's so lush and everything. He goes, they don't have a sprinkler system. The ground is just blessed. You can tell if you fertilize your grass. If you hadn't fertilized your grass, it doesn't look real good and thick. It looks like they fertilize it, they water it. It's because the, the dirt is so blessed. Because God told Abraham. God, this is how powerful the covenant is. God told Abraham, it's your dirt. Watch it. In the latter years, I'll make it look so prosperous that everybody's going to want your dirt. Wow, hallelujah. So what does this tell us? We have all these signs. Tell us Jesus is coming back real soon. Thanks for your enthusiasm. Good night. We'll see you later. Go over to, go over to uh, Matthew. Go to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24. We're going to finish our course. Look at Matthew 24 real quick for just a little bit, and then we'll, then we'll close. Matthew 24, look at verse 1. Jesus went out. You've, you know these verses so well, but I want you to see this just a second. Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And the disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. Jesus said, See not all these things. Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. As he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when are these things going to be? What will be the sign of your coming into the end of the world or the end of the age? Now they're asking him, What's, the, what's it going to look like? And Jesus didn't rebuke them. In fact, he rebuked them for not knowing their hour of visitation. He said, you can discern the face of the sky, but you don't know your hour of visitation. So he wants you to know what time it is. Now, why do you, Israel's your timepiece. Why do you wear a watch? So you'll be where you're supposed to be on time. You won't miss an appointment. God's got appointments for all of your lives. You watch right after we're raptured. You'll look into your spirit, and you'll see all the things that were sown into you right here at the very last of the church age. So that people could see what Jesus is really like in your life. Pretty amazing. So watch what Jesus says here. Look what he says in, in verse number 4. He said, Take heed that no man deceive you. Many will come in my name, saying, I'm Christ, and shall deceive many. You'll hear of wars, rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Nations shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There'll be famines, there'll be pestilence, there'll be earthquakes in divers places. Well, you could, I got an app on my phone we were talking about last night. It, if I used to have it where it texts me every time there was an earthquake, but it's just... Burr, 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 burr. I mean, it's just earthquakes. The, the, the frequency of earthquakes is off the chart. Yeah. Unbelievable. He said, but watch what he says here in verse 9. Well, verse 8, he said, all these are the beginning of sorrows. That's the word birth pains. You know, they said, what's the sign of your coming? I would have said the glory of God in the church. He said, when you see this seven-year period, you can know I'm about to come back. Well, I'm not going to be here during that seven-year period, but I can see things set up for that seven-year period. And that's what he said the signs would be. Why? Seven years of signs that you can't miss. Now, we don't have to have them because we're gone. 
I mean, can you imagine the water turning to blood? You're fishing, not catching much today. Hmm. Playing golf, all of a sudden it gets dark in the middle of the day. So there are going to be seven years of drastic signs on the earth, just like Moses and Pharaoh. I guess I'll, everybody's looking at the pastor like I'm saying something wrong, so I'll stand right here. I've been traveling a long time. It's going to be just like Moses and Pharaoh. The signs are going to be exactly the same. And what were they for? To make uh, Pharaoh change his heart. So the earth's going to have seven years of some drama because most people will wait till the very end to get saved. I prayed for a man up in Canada. I prayed for this woman. I walked back to her. I said, what do you need? She goes, I need a new, need a new knee. I'm getting a new knee replacement. I said, well, let's pray for your knee. I said, I command your knee to be whole. I said, how are you doing? She goes, it still hurts a little bit. I said, well, walk with me a little bit. And then how do we enforce that miracle? Thankfulness. Father, thank you that what we just prayed for, she's got it. Thank you. It's done. All of a sudden, she shot up in the air. She's about 75. Scared me. She goes, Phoom. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> she took off running. This is in Keith Johnson's church up in Saskatoon. I gave the altar call, and there was a man there about 90 years old. He raised his hand. I said, you don't even have to come down. He seemed so frail. I said, I'll come to you. So I walked over to him and said, man, thanks for raising your hand. You're going to get saved. We all prayed the sinner's prayer. <clears throat> His first time to ever come to church. His wife had been praying for him for 40-some years. His son was there. It was so cool he got born again. Gave his life to the Lord. And the next day I go to the airport to leave. The pastor called me. He said, last night that man went home to be with the Lord. Wow. Wow. Now that's cutting it close. <laughs> You don't, you, you don't want to go, hey, I, you get to heaven. When did you get saved? Like seconds before I went off. Like, Woo! Well, well, see, that seven-year period is to put so much pressure on people that they'll make a decision. See, I don't have to be here during that seven years. I've already made the decision. But notice Jesus said it would be some, some, some trouble would be on the earth. It would be just like a woman going into labor. Have you ever seen a woman start having contractions and say, let's go play golf? <laughs> let's, it's time for football. No. When, when a woman starts going into labor, what, what's the number one thing on her mind? It's time for this baby to come. In other words, it so consumes her that she goes, it's time for me to birth this baby. Jesus said there'd be some things on the earth that would be so consuming, you can't miss it. And you see the symptoms of that even right now. Like Islam will be judged during that seven-year period. 20 years ago, you didn't even talk about Islam. Now Islam's attacked our country. Yeah. It's the whore of Babylon. Where did it come from? Baghdad, the origin of every false religion. Our country went into Baghdad twice. Well, you could preach on that for a while. Mm. But let me give you a couple more signs. Listen to this one. Then we're closing right now. I want you to get a couple more. Steven Tyler, lead singer for Aerosmith, yeah. got saved. That's a sign. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> about, about four or five years ago, he got born again. You can watch him on YouTube singing Amazing Grace. You say, well, I don't own, was that crazy? Their last CD before this last one, Jesus on the main line, tell him what you want. You're kidding me. Yeah, I've never heard Aerosmith singing miracle songs from the 50s. <laughs> When, when Aerosmith's getting saved, Jesus is about to come back. <laughs> Trust me. This other one's pretty good, though. And this is, how many watch the Animal Planet channel? Anybody watch that? I don't really watch that that much. I like the History Channel. I'm scrolling across the Animal Planet channel. Now, the only reason I know this is because my brother was an ornithologist. There was a lady on there. She was a, I want you guys to get this. So bless you. She's an Israeli ornithologist. That's a bird specialist. My brother went to college for eight years to be a bird specialist. My dad said, what did you learn in college, Steve? He said, I learned how to play poker. Anyway. <laughs> but he, you go to school for eight years, learn how to study birds, okay? So this Israeli ornithologist is on there, and she says, we don't understand it. The largest gathering ever of predatory birds, ever. 172 different species of predatory birds. I'm going, holy smokes. I know exactly why they're coming there. Because right after the Ezekiel 38 war, which is right after we're raptured, he calls on the fowl of the air to go clean the land up from all the flesh that's been killed there. At the end of the tribulation, the angel calls on the fowl of the air to come clean the land up. Okay, you've already got the cleanup crew that's been showing up in Israel. Wow. It, you, they may have thought Noah was crazy, but when the animals showed up, something's up. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you can Google it today. Google it. You look at all. They don't understand why there's that many coming there. I was in the San Diego Zoo, and there were like 50-some-odd kinds of eagles, 30-some-odd kinds of hawks, t so many kinds of vultures. God's bringing them there. Why? Because Jesus is just about to come back. All these things are set up right in front of our eyes. So what do we do in church? What do we do? Uh, let's be a witness. Whatever God's called us to do, let's run faster than we've ever run. You let your fire and your zeal for God so get over into everybody else that they can't help but go, my God, I've got to do the will of God. 
Could you imagine standing before the Son of God right after we're raptured and, and go, man, I, I didn't give it my all. See, just like when Lauren saw that finish line, she goes, I've got to give it my all. This is the hour to hustle and to do more than we've ever done before, ever. This is the hour to sprint, to just lay, lay aside weights and sins. This is the hour just to go, man, Jesus is just about to come back. I can give you hope. There's, there's many more signs. But Jesus said, you see two of these. You're in the generation. People go, could, we, could it really be us? Yeah, it is us. Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth. Wow, coming back to the Mount of Olives. Won't that be cool? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the Bible says that um, there's going to be a great earthquake and the throne will be raised up a couple hundred feet. Now listen to this. The water that comes beside Jesus will go out in and it will purify all the waters on the earth just because it goes near Jesus. <laughs> and you have Jesus living in you. The water getting near Jesus will purify all the water on the whole planet. Yeah. And out of your belly would flow rivers of living water. Man, you are the foretaste uh -huh. of that next thousand years. You are the walking representation of that kingdom. You're the demonstrators of the life of God in the earth. So that people go, I never saw that. Well, my person I work with, they prayed for people and they got healed. The person I work with, they had peace. They had joy. They slept at night. <laughs> the person I work with, <laughs> he gives his beloved sleep. Jesus coming back to the planet. Jesus to rule and reign for a thousand years. Jesus, the author of life. Jesus, the one who redeemed you. Jesus... Wow, the one that lights everything that comes into the earth. Wow, your Lord and your Savior and your King, you're about to meet face to face. How wild would that be to go from faith to sight to where we'll see Him as He is. Eyes as a flame of fire, feet like undefined brass, voice of many waters. I know that we'll hit our knees and we'll go, thank you for dying for us. Thank you for giving your life for us. Hallelujah. Well, we're going to come back tonight and get into some more stuff. We'll get into some stuff. I want to show you what you'll be functioning in in the next dispensation. I want to give you kind of a preview. If you want to see some movies coming out, you want to have a kind of a teaser. I'm going to give you a preview of what your future is. And what it does, it makes you operate in what you're supposed to operate in. Because right now, you're tasting of the powers of the world to come. So if we're tasting of it, won't it be wonderful when we're devouring it and eating it and enjoying it? We have great things ahead. You have wonderful things for your future. If you hear end time preaching and it scares you, it's not Bible. If you hear end time preaching and it produces fear, it's not Bible. Because you only have great things ahead for you. I, I think of the investment that God has put in Pastor Ed and what he has for your church. There's an investment for the last days. <laughs> to have a church that has the Word and the move of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Amen. Amen. There's a payoff. There's a payoff for doing what's right. Oh, yeah. Amen. You'll be blessed. I look forward to seeing the helicopter pad, you know. And I think you should get a bat pole a little bit bigger than that thing. Pastor Ed could slide down right at the beginning of the deal, start preaching. I don't think you, you know, the cape would be cool, but you don't have to wear the, the whole outfit, the tie. No ties. No ties. Hallelujah. Church is probably happy I'm not wearing the tights, too. Praise the Lord. Amen. No tights for Pastor Ed. Amen. Hey, thanks for coming today. Aren't you glad Jesus is coming soon? Amen. Let's thank Him for just a minute before we dismiss. Lord, we love You. Lord, we're so grateful. Grateful. Grateful that we're saved. Thank You for the hour in which we live, Lord. We, we see these signs, how close we are. So we as believers, we worship You. We magnify You. We lift up our voice in adoration with such thanksgiving. We have a, a spirit of thanksgiving. Father, thank You for dying for us. We're so grateful for all that you have given us. Yes, Lord, we, we, we come to you. We come to you to, to express our gratitude. We're here on Sunday morning. We, we love you, Jesus. I thank you for blessing every person that came. I thank you for great strength for them. I thank you for supernatural revelation for them about how close they are to your return, Jesus. You're so good to us, Lord. I thank you for using them, the supernatural, signs and wonders, gifts of the Holy Ghost, distributions of the glory of God through all of their lives. I thank you for it, Father. Yes, we give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' wonderful name. Amen, yes. amen and amen.
Praise the Lord. Man, He's good. His mercy endures forever. Now, you'll see in the days to come, you'll see an explosion uh, of authority in the name of Jesus. Yeah. It'll almost be like a, an injection of our deposit. Like, wow, I know what I have in the name. You'll see an explosion of the gifts of the Spirit. Oh, yeah. you'll, see, you'll see waves of working of miracles and special faith. You'll see the believer functioning in such a way that you'll, you'll just be going, you'll stand beside yourself and go, could I have even thought like that? Mm -hmm. I mean, people being raised from the dead, people getting eye sockets back, their eyes gone, burned, boom, brand new right there. Just radical demonstrations. Yes. Hallelujah. Because He is so good. Yes. His mercy endures forever. Yes. Hallelujah. He wants to use you. And that's why we got into this about the end times. You don't have a lot of time. Mm -hmm. Don't have a lot of time left. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. So don't put off an appointment with the Lord. You know, let's pray more than we ever have. Study more than we ever have. Hear the word more than we ever have. And be strengthened. Hallelujah. So we bring our supply. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. I'm sure glad you guys came today. God bless you, man, for coming from Virginia to see your, your daughter and came over to visit their church. Yay, 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 yay. Hey, is there anybody here not saved? I want to make sure everybody's born again. I think you, there were no visitors, but if you are a visitor, make sure you come back and, and hear Pastor Ed. Yeah. But if you're, if, you're, if you're not a visitor, you know to, this is your church. Hallelujah. Everybody filled with the Holy Ghost? Anybody want to get filled this morning? You've not been baptized? Yeah. See, I'm here and I'm not been filled. I think we had in the church in uh, Rocky Mount 17 filled. Wow. I think there were so, so many. One night, 12 or th so, five the next night. Uh, there's a whole new crop of people coming in that need yeah, to be baptized right. in the Holy Ghost. That's right. If you're here and you've never been filled and you want to get to today, Jesus said you'll be endued with power, not weirdness. Power. Hmm. If you're going to race cars, you don't want a two-cylinder engine. You want an eight-cylinder. Even then, you want a 12-cylinder. Even then, maybe twin turbocharged. I've never heard a guy go, I want less horsepower. No. <laughs> you want more horsepower. <laughs> if, you, if you're here and you've never done that, you want to do it today, I want to pray for you. Say, I want to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. And you want it all real quick. We'll, we'll take it a second. Just raise your hand. Say, that's me. I'd like to be filled. Don't be embarrassed if you haven't gotten it. You don't have to get it today. You just, it'd be good for you to get it because it'll bless you. Amen. It'll strengthen right. you. Right. Amen, amen. Praise the Lord. His mercy endures forever. Thanks for coming today. So good of you to come to hear the word. Wow. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. For as much as you see that day approaching. So we can see that day coming. Wow. Let's get more and more excited than we've ever been. Amen. Wow. Jesus. Jesus. Coming back to the planet. Wow. Praise the Lord. Well, have a great, great Sunday. And uh, come back tonight. What time service tonight? 6.30. 6.30 tonight. We're going to show you photographs of the Antichrist. Just kidding. Praise the Lord. It's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Just a joke, praise the Lord. No, you know the guys on TV, the most shocking photographs of the Antichrist. I'm like, no, <laughs> nobody knows who he is yet. No, thank you for being so easy to preach to. You remember, talk to your friends and your neighbors about Jesus coming back. He said to exhort one another, comfort one another. It means to call nearer to God. So when you say, hey, hey, the Lord's coming back. You don't have to go, the Lord! You don't have to do it like that. You, if you want to, but it'd be cool to just go, hey man, guess what? Jesus is coming back. Are you ready? They go, I'm not saved. you got to get saved. Don't be a loser. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know what I mean? You can present it, you can present it however you want, but we, uh, bless their hearts, they're the ones that, that need to be redeemed. Amen. So it called them nearer to the Lord. You're His witness. You're His voice. You're His mouthpiece. Amen. Amen. Have an awesome Sunday. Thanks for having me come, Pastor. All we'll right. see you tonight. Praise the Lord.